to sing to y'all. And um, I'm thinking of the Bible verses where Christ was at Pilate's and he sent him back down to Herod. And Herod sent him back to Pilate. And, and that trip that he made was, it had to be, that, it was, he was God, he could do it, but being a man, I mean, he had the strength to do that. And so it takes a big man to do that. And that's the name of this song. <clears throat> I've sailed through troubled waters on the stormy sea of life. I've seen some gloomy days, walked through some dark old nights. But walking close beside me is a friend who'll never leave. Through troubles and trials, I can still wear a smile. Cause I know he's watching over me And my Lord's big enough to fight my battles Big enough to calm my fears Big enough to solve my problems Big enough to dry my tears He's big enough to pick me up When I stumble and fall But when I come to the banks of the chilly Jordan River He'll be big enough to carry me across Sometimes it seems each step I take will surely be my last. I've been in raging waters where I was sinking fast, but from all the trials of where I started till I reached my heavenly home, well, I never and I know I'll never have to go it all alone. And my Lord's big enough to fight my battles, Big enough to calm my fears, big enough to solve my problems, big enough to dry my tears. He's big enough to pick me up when I stumble and fall. But when I come to the banks of a chilly Jordan River, he'll be big enough to carry me across. Now for scripture reading of God's word. 1 Peter 3, 13 through 15. <clears throat> Who is going to harm you if you are eager to do good? But even if you should suffer for what is right, you are blessed. Do not fear their threats. Do not be frightened. But in your hearts revere, revere God Christ as Lord. Always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you, to give the reasons for the hope that you have. But do this with gentleness and respect. So be it. Tim, thank you for reminding me, because with baskets and other things, I'd probably be sitting here Wednesday night saying, you know, honey, we don't have Awanas, should we do anything? And then I'll get hit up, well, you know what today is, that would not be good. And, you know, that's one of the things I am thankful for is a wonderful marriage. I mean, it has its trials and tribulations, but I know there's some guys in here, and I want to say that, that it is the blessing to see your marriages, to see what a good marriage looks like. And I might have Kim beat. She's 21, Kim and Luke's 21 years. Sharon, I'll be 33. But I think about every time that I was born, John and Wanda were getting married when I was born. And there are some that's been married longer than 55 years. Yeah, so. Yes, Bella. There's my blessing. Okay, well, you need to go that way. Go, sweetie. Come on. Go to Debbie. Go, so you can have fun. No. <laughs> That's where Debbie usually sits. <laughs> That's one of my four blessings. <laughs> we had one child, never dreamed we'd have four grandchildren from that. I thought the Henson line was, but it's not. No, not that close together either, yeah. Let's start with prayer. 
Father in heaven, we do thank you and praise you for you are a mighty, wonderful God. A God that I don't even have words to say. We sinned against our creator, against the one that desired to be in a relationship with us, to provide us everything that we needed. And yet you still love us. You love us in all of our filthiness. You loved us so much that you knew it would cost your son's life. You loved us so much and you love us so much and you want to restore us back to a right place in the garden. And Lord, let us know that you realize today as we read in your word that your kingdom has come here on earth and we are the hands and feet. Lord, bringing the message of Jesus Christ and the gospel message to men. Lord, help us to be the hands and feet as well as the voice to this world. Let us not be hypocrites, but let us be united in a Christ-like mind to love one another, to love even our enemies, and to let the world know that we are Christians by the way that we live, by the way that we love, and by the way that we proclaim Jesus Christ. Lord, just open our hearts and minds. Fill us with your spirit today. Equip us for the spiritual battles that we face, and Lord, give us the boldness that we need to preach the message. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. So I entitled this Divide and Conquer because Satan tries to attack the church in Acts chapter 6 to divide it. But instead, the church kind of divides so that they can conquer. I mean, you've got to realize that you're in a spiritual battle, but you've got to realize your mission also. And um, Merle read from 1 Peter 3 where Peter would go on to write those words later, and I'm going to read some more of, uh, of that here in just a little bit. But realize that we are in a spiritual battle, that we serve one king or another. We're either with Jesus or we're against Jesus. We're either gathering or we're scattering. It's about kings and kingdoms and who you pledge your allegiance to. It's about whether you have salvation, new birth through the Spirit of God to live a new life by the Spirit or you don't. And what is your excuse if you have the Spirit of life living in you to not live to not grow, to not be the kind of Christian like Christ that God has called you to be. And the church grew as a result of this, of this dividing. They grew stronger. They grew in numbers. And even some of the priests became obedient to the way. We'll, we'll read that in just a little bit. So we finished off with la in last week in Acts chapter 5, and I want to read a little bit of there as a review again. In Acts chapter 5, verse 17 through 20, it says, Then the high priest and all his associates, were, <clears throat> who were members of the party of the Sadducees, they were filled with jealousy. That's so many times the, the, the thing that divides people. Jealousy, envy, I've got to be right, I want my way, whatever it, whatever it is. And we can take that sin right back to the garden. We can take it to Cain and Abel. It's the, so many of the root of our problems. As a result of this jealousy, verse 18, they arrested the apostles and put them into public jail. Verse 19, but that total opposite. During the night, an angel of the Lord opened the doors of the jail and brought them out. And he said to them, go stand in the temple courts, he said, and tell the people all about this new life. And if you remember, I told you that they didn't get time to stand out there long. They probably had no sleep that night and everything. And were they really supposed to speak the words that day to the people or were they supposed to have another chance to give the message to the religious leaders? And follow this as you're following through because you'll see that, like I said, coming up at the end of this passage today, even a large number of priests became obedient to the way. <clears throat> the apostles were obedient. They didn't worry about what was going to happen to them. It resulted in them being arrested again, and then it literally, after they were able to present the gospel message again to, to the Sadducees and the other religious leaders, they were literally stripped of their skin for being a testimony of Jesus Christ, for preaching in His name, for preaching resurrection from the dead. But instead, they rejoiced. We move down to Acts chapter 5, verse 41 and 42. The apostles left the Sanhedrin rejoicing because they had been counted worthy of suffering disgrace for the name. We know that name. There is no other name given to men whereby we must be saved. The name above all names, Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, our Redeemer, our friend, our brother, the one who gives us peace that surpasses all understanding, even in the times that are the hardest thing, times in our life. 
And I appreciate, Barry, you bringing up the Thanksgiving, too, so that we can remember all that, not just this time of year, but in every single circumstance. They rejoiced. In verse 42, day after day in the temple, temple courts and from house to house, they never stopped teaching and proclaiming the good news that Jesus is the Messiah, the chosen one of God, the Holy One, the, people, the person that would save people from their sins. Now we have chapter 6. But before we go there, I want you to think of something, and we'll mention this back for the last few weeks. What do you think about the thought of being saved to suffer? Because we're going to watch this progression where Christians suffer more and more and more. And without that suffering, the gospel message wouldn't have actually been taken to, to the utter ends of the earth. Without the Romans conquering the known world, there wouldn't be the road systems and everything else. There wouldn't be the language barrier that, that, that was conquered at that time and everything. At just the right time, God sent Jesus. While we were still enemies, Christ died for us. <clears throat> but what do you think about that saved to suffer? The apostles, we see them that they rejoiced even when they were, had their skin ripped off of their body. Do you think the church felt that same way, though? Do we feel that same way? It doesn't mention that the church is glad about that rejoicing. They listen to the apostles' words, and so many times we are guilty of listening to God's word, whether it's coming from the pulpit or coming from you reading your Bible or coming from the Holy Spirit pricking your heart. But do we absorb that? Do we have the mindset of Christ that, that he considered the suffering and shame that he would do as glory to him that he was doing the father's will and yes it was hard as Merle said he said to take this cup from me father if it's your will but not your will but my I mean not my will but your will saved to suffer well it's easy to say this and and think that God is in control of all things right we, we know that and not a hair on our head will be harmed outside of God's will but rejoicing in being saved to suffer? Can you say that? And you know, it's foreign to us. If you could say, oh, oh I, I, can, I can imagine that. No, you can't because we haven't had that. You might lose your job. You might get the finger pointed at you. But you're not going to be arrested and then you're not going to be stripped of your skin in this country yet. But there are Christians all over the world that get persecuted and martyred for their faith. It still happens today. So we are blessed. We should be so thankful. We should be so eager to go out and spread the good news while you're not being stripped of your skin. So I ask you, are you sharing the gospel message? And what do you think about this save to suffer, this persecution, because we may face it in our lifetime, we may not. But would you count it as a privilege? Would you rejoice in the fact? And as we see from the church pattern here, we see that the church grew and grew and grew, that it was strengthened. You can go all over Scripture and find out all the things that this helps build perseverance and character and everything else. But it's not something to think that's easy to swallow and easy to think about. And something you definitely, while you have the freedom, should be spreading the gospel message with all the joy, all the fervency that you have in your heart while you have that opportunity. <clears throat> their faith and their testimony is what will co cost them their lives. And we read that again in Revelation. So... What do you think the church thought they were facing? Did they have any idea? Well, the apostles had an idea. They followed Jesus for, for three years, and then they watched him being persecuted. And now they're facing the same thing. But even when I see that, I think that, well, it, I don't think it'll happen to me. Yeah, I kind of think that's how the th church thought, but that's my, my thought process. The, you know, those guys out there, they're the ones sticking out their neck. So would it make me complacent? Would it make me, you know, whatever? I, I don't want to say they're fearful because we've already had that where they got the fear of God in them. But what I think it would happen to me and would I rejoice in it? 
Well, we're going to keep reading and we're going to see what happens to Stephen. And we're going to see as a result that the church is scattered. And when we think back to those words that Peter wrote, we know that he wrote those words right before Nero came in and started persecuting Christians like I cannot even fathom again. So was, he prepared, was God preparing them for that time as he was spreading the gospel message? And isn't the gift of eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord worth anything? <laughs> We have so many blessings, so many things to be thankful for. Let's be thankful every day and live a joyful, happy life telling others when they see the good lives that we live of the hope that is in us. But remember to do that with meekness and kindness because you're given an opportunity to be the ambassador for God. Maybe the church was rejoicing with the apostles. Maybe they weren't. It would be hard. It would be even impossible, as like I said, to even understand. They probably felt like they were rejoicing, but until you go through something, that's a little different story, isn't it? It's easy to have compassion and, and feelings for somebody, but until you go through some of the things that they've gone through, you don't necessarily understand. Do you understand martyrdom? I certainly do not. And it's not something that I can say that I long for, but Merle and I talk about that a good bit. You know, I know that the Holy Spirit will fill me at that time for whatever that I'm facing so that I can walk through that valley of the shadow of death. That I won't fear any evil because God is with me. And that I know that I have the peace that surpasses all understanding. That no matter what happens, that my, my soul is safe and secure. And I know the people that I leave behind. I know I couldn't do anything to save anyway other than being that testimony other than proclaiming and living that life, that God will take care of them. So I, t I tell you, my motto verse is still the same motto verse. It's from Hebrews 11. It's where Noah, out of holy fear, builds an ark to save his family. That's the kind of life I'm going to live for however long it takes, whether it makes sense or not. I'm going to fix my eyes on Jesus and live a life that brings him glory and honor and let him save my family because I couldn't do it in the first place. And if you read that verse... It, means, it goes on to say that he condemns the world, the way of living of it. And he's accounted as righteous. So I want to read you some from 1 Peter. Um, some, some, of those, some more of those words. 1 Peter 4.12, we have that, Dear friends, do not be surprised at the fiery ordeal that has come to you to test you as though something strange were happening to you. Jesus said it time and time again, Do not be surprised. <clears throat> And when this happens to you, the Holy Spirit will give you the words to say everything else that you need. And it's about those words we see that, that the Holy Spirit fills the church. It's about the fact that they can proclaim. We see the mighty miracles are so that they can proclaim. And we're getting up to a point where the, the word is spreading all through Jerusalem the number of followers of, of Jesus, and we're talking about committed followers, not them just signing up for, okay, this sounds good, but we're going to give our lives for it. We're going to become disciples. The number is increasing and increasing. <clears throat> the greatest thing that the Christians had back then and Christians have now, believers, disciples, whatever you want to say, is the privilege, the gift of knowing Christ and making him known. Period. No matter what circumstance you're in, and it's the reason that you've been given new life. So that you can live the kind of life that God requires to be wholly set apart and then proclaim. It's all about the message. The privilege that you have of telling others about Jesus Christ. So I want to read you some of those words that Peter wrote later to the church. These words that were just prior to a tremendous persecution. And I'm start, starting in 1 Peter 3, verse 8. Finally, all of you, be like-minded, be sympathetic, love one another, be compassionate and humble. Do not repay evil with evil or insult with insult. On the contrary, repay evil with a blessing. Because of this, you were called so that you may inherit a blessing. He quotes that from Psalm 34, verses 12 to 16. Whoever would love life and see good days must keep their tongue from evil and their lips from deceitful speech. 
They must turn from evil and do good. They must seek peace and pursue it. For the eyes of the Lord are on the righteous, and His ears are attentive to their prayer. But the face of the Lord is against those who do evil. That's the quote from Psalms 34. Who is going to harm you if you're eager to do good? But even if you should suffer for what is right, you are blessed. And then he goes on to quote from Isaiah chapter 8, verse 12. Do not fear their threats. Do not be frightened. But instead, in your heart, revere Christ as Lord. Always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you to give the reason for the hope that you have. And that hope is what makes us smile, what keeps us faithful, what makes us rejoice and be thankful. That hope that no one else can take away, no matter what the persecution or suffer, suffering or trial or test that comes your way. <clears throat> But do this with gentleness and respect, keeping a clear conscience so that those who speak maliciously against your good behavior in Christ will be ashamed of their slander. For it is better if it is God's will to suffer for doing good than for doing evil. And then in 1 Peter chapter 4, Therefore, since Christ suffered in His body, arm yourselves also with the same attitude. The attitude that Jesus not feared, but as a man dreaded, we'll put that word in there, whether you, that's the exact word I should use or not, what was going to happen to him. And we're not talking about just the beating and the persecution and, and the, the false accusations and everything. We're talking about his disciples betraying him. We're talking about his Father in heaven forsaking him because he carried our sin and shame. Wow, all the things that Jesus Christ did because of His love for us and His will to do the Father's will, which is to reconcile mankind to God. Arm yourselves also with the same attitude because whoever suffers in the body is done with sin. As a result, they do not live the rest of their earth, earthly lives for evil desires, but rather for the will of God can get a glimpse of the suffering, how that would help for that. I can look at my own life and look at some of the things that I've gone through and it's made me stronger. For you have spent enough time in the past doing what pagans choose to do, living in debauchery, lust, drunkenness, orgies, carousing, and detestable idolatry. Problem is that we always want to say we don't do those things, don't, do we? But Jesus said if you've had an evil thought towards your brother, you're guilty of murder. So how is your mind? Is it the same mindset of Christ? Are you willing to suffer for Jesus' name and for the gospel? <clears throat> they are surprised that you do not join them in their reckless wild living, and they heap abuse on you. But they will have to give an account to him who is <clears throat> ready to judge the living and the dead. I'm dropping down to verse 12. Dear friends, do not be surprised at the fiery ordeal that has come on to test you. And we don't know what that fiery ordeal is exactly. But there is a fiery ordeal that they will be facing, truly facing. Do not be surprised at the fiery ordeal that's come to test you as though something strange were happening to you. But instead rejoice inasmuch as you participate in the sufferings of Christ so that you may be overjoyed when His glory is revealed. If you are insulted because of the name of Christ, you are blessed, for the spirit of glory and of God rests on you. If you suffer, it should, be, it should not be as a murderer or thief or any kind of criminal, or even as a meddler. Oh, I'm guilty of that one. <laughs> However, if you suffer as a Christian, do not be ashamed, but praise God that you bear that name. Now, I think everyone in here knows what happens to Stephen. And if you read this verse right there, maybe it popped out to you. But rejoice in as much as you participate in the sufferings of Christ so that you may be overjoyed when His glory is revealed. Do you remember heaven opened up for Stephen and he saw the glory of Jesus? I mean, literally, we're going to see that coming up. The hope that we have that no one can take it away from us, that no matter what happens to us, no matter what we go through, that our hope is firmly founded on Jesus Christ and what He did on the cross and how much God loves you. So let's go back to the story in Acts. I'm <clears throat> picking up at the end of chapter 5, 
Verse 41, the apostles left the Sanhedrin rejoicing. Why? Because they had been counted worthy of suffering disgrace for the name, that name of Jesus. Verse 42, day after day, it didn't slow them down. It didn't scare them. It gave them the initiative that they needed to push them. Day after day in the temple courts right there in public, and from house to house in private meetings, they never, ever stopped teaching and proclaiming the good news that Jesus was the Messiah. Reading straight through into Acts 6, in those days when the number of disciples was increasing, the Hellenistic Jews among them complained, and that's why I started off with a jealousy that was back from the Sadducees. Be careful when that starts to prick your heart when Satan comes in to tempt you with jealousy, and especially the murmurings and complaining that then result. They complained against the Hebraic Jews because their widows were being overlooked in the daily distribution of food. So the twelve gathered all the disciples together and said, It would not be right for us to neglect the ministry of the word of God in order to wait on tables. Brothers and sisters, choose seven men from among you who are known to be full of spirit and wisdom. We will turn this responsibility over to them and give our attention to prayer and the ministry of the word. This proposal pleased the whole group. They chose Stephen, a man full of faith and the Holy Spirit, also Philip, and then I'm not going to try to read the others, Merle, because I'll stumble on them. But we'll just, well, we'll try. Procurus, Nicanor, Timon, Parmenas, Nick, and Nicholas from Antioch. Okay. A, a convert to Judaism. They presented these men to the apostles who prayed and laid hands on them. So the word of God spread. The numbers of, of disciples in J Jerusalem increased rapidly and a large number of priests became obedient to the faith. Now here's where it helps. You can, and this is what the church was doing. And this is what we see in this pattern. The disciples were setting themselves apart for ministry of God's word. And they said to select from you men that can minister the programs that we need, okay? Which was food distribution in this case. The apostles were set aside for teaching, to know what God's Word says, and there's so much in this little bit of Scripture if you look at it. And there's so much that I'm not even going to touch on today. I even made your little handout, and Kira was helping me with this, and she's like, this is neat, Papa. It's a maze. Because so many times in the church, we can get cluttered up and distracted and, and we argue and we're jealous and we bicker over the color of the carpet or something like that and forget our mission. That our mission is because God so loved the world that we have the church in the first place. And that the church is to go out and take your cross and proclaim the gospel message through word and through deed through action. So I'll give everybody one of these in a minute, but let's break this down a little bit. <clears throat> Verse 41, the apostles left the Sanhedrin doing what? Rejoicing. Why? Because they had been counted worthy of suffering disgrace. I remember I told you that they got beat more than likely 40 minus 1 lashes. And the only reason that 40 minus one was set up in the first place is because you didn't beat a man that much. Beyond that, that made him an animal. So they suffered to the point of disgrace that they were this close to being a mule or whatever it was, to lose their dignity as a human being created in God's image. And why did they get beat this bad? Because they proclaimed the message of Jesus Christ even though the religious leaders told them to stop. And they'd already said, is it better for us to obey God or to obey men? And we see several times that the Holy Spirit gave them the opportunity to witness to the religious leaders. And the great thing is, because we don't see it, we can't see God's plan and everything else, is we see here that some of the religious leaders became obedient, finally. So if they didn't go through those things, would those religious leaders got the message enough that they became obedient? I don't know. But God knows. And we're supposed to walk by faith, not by sight, fixing our eyes on Jesus with the same mindset as Jesus. I cannot fathom this at all, this disgrace for the name of Jesus, but it takes me to words that Paul wrote while he was in jail in Philippians 3, verses 7 through 12. But whatever were gain to me, I now consider loss for the sake of Christ. 
What is more, I consider everything a loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord, for whose sake I have lost all things. I consider them garbage that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ. The righteousness that comes from God on the basis of faith. I want to know Christ, yet yes, to know the power of his resurrection and to participate in his sufferings, becoming like him in death. And so somehow attaining to the resurrection from the dead. Not that I have already obtained all this or have already arrived at my goal, but I press on to take hold of that for which Christ Jesus took hold of me. And I think about where we're at in Acts, and I think about Paul's teacher is the one who got them released last time, but he said, don't touch these men. But yet they were enraged with so much jealousy and anger that they still beat them. When Gamaliel said, don't touch them, let them go. Because if this is a work of God, you're not going to stop it, and you don't want to be fighting against God. And if this is a work of man, it'll fizzle out anyway. But because they were so angry and jealous... They whipped them. And then we're going to see in this next chapter coming up that Paul's there while Stephen's being stoned. But we know the story, don't we? We have the God's Word. So we can study and meditate on it and, and have this pattern of the church that we can know that Saul, then later we we're address him as Paul, and we'll get into that, but that's not a name change. It's just the Hebrew name versus the Greek name. Jesus didn't change his name, if you didn't know that. He changed Peter's, okay? But that's a different subject, I wonder. Um, we see Paul being the main one after Barnabas lets Paul take the lead, too, the son of encouragement, that takes the gospel <laughs> message to so many places throughout the foreign world. And this scattering is what helps send them out that's going to come. Verse 42, day after day in the temple courts from house to house, they never, ever, I'm adding ever in there, ever, ever, ever stopped teaching and proclaiming the good news that Jesus is the Messiah. No matter what it costs, no matter what distractions, we realize what our message for the church is. That the, that the apostles are training us and teaching us to be the hands and feet of Jesus Christ. Chapter 6, in those days when the number of disciples were increasing, did you catch that, that the word disciple is used? It's Mathetaeus. It is, Luke is precise, he's a doctor in his writing, he says the number of disciples, because he doesn't want you to get the thought process, and the church has the thought process some today, that there are some that are disciples and that there some aren't. Jesus was clear, if you want to become his disciple... There was no distinction. If you are a believer in Jesus Christ, you are a disciple of Jesus Christ. Trained up to follow Him and to, as the Great Commission says, train up disciples once the conversion happens. And we do this to the utter ends of the earth. Don't ever not call yourself a disciple. Luke is purposeful in writing it here. <clears throat> The word is also used in Acts chapter 1, verse 15. In those days, Peter stood up among the believers, is what the NIV says, but the word is mathetes. He stood up among the disciples. This is where you want to study God's word. He st stood up among the disciples, numbering about 120. We know in chapter 2 that this 120 would grow and be called the church. Okay? And we continue to see the growth of the church. And we continue to see the proclaiming of the disciples, all of them, through the apostles and through one another. And we see the numbers increasing. But we also see how Satan attacks. We've seen the, the, the example of Ananias and Sapphira and everything else. And now he's going to try to attack by the color of the carpet or whatever it is. I use the color of the carpet because that has destroyed a many of churches. <laughs> we'll say the nursery for another one. Why? Why would my arm say to the rest of my body, I don't want that color carpet. I'm going to pull myself from you. I mean, that's how Paul says it. We're one body. 
all pu pulled together, each having a function, gifts, and so forth that the Spirit gives them. So while the number of disciples were increasing, then the Hellenistic Jews, and don't lose focus, that just means Greek speaking. The Greek speaking Jews among them complained. They murmured. Now I go back and I think about, because they the apostles were preaching the Old Testament and revealing scripture, just as Jesus did. And I think about the children of Israel grumbling and complaining in the wilderness, and the destroying angel and the snakes and and everything else murmuring and complaining against God rather than thanking Him like we did today. They murmured and grumbled and complained against their brothers, against the Hebraic Jews. Maybe it was because of jealousy. Maybe it was because of a legitimate complaint. It doesn't matter. We don't want to be divided and lose focus of the mission. Remember, I started it out with the Sadducees were filled with jealousy and they arrested the apostles and then it led to them being beaten. But it did not stop the message. The point is the message. And we have to live that holy life to present that message or we're a hypocrite. That opportunity won't come of the hope that we have. The reason that they were jealous, the reason that they complained was because the widows, okay, now let's take it a little more than what is at face value here? The poor. The, the Old Testament scriptures are, are, are full of taking care of the poor, the widow and the orphan, and even the wanderer, the foreigner in your land, to take care of them. And there may have been many widows in this time because of the Roman government and everything else, but there is a need that the Jews understood and that the church understands that we take care of our poor and they were being overlooked in the daily distribution of food. We also look back and remember that people sold their property. They considered things not to be their own and there were no needy people among them. So we don't know how the needy got to this point, but there are people with a need. We don't look at why they have a need, whether they deserve help or not. They were supposed to be given their distribution of food. And it's falling on the apostles, but this could distract them from teaching and preaching the gospel message. So the church was becoming divided. And again, like I said, look at how many times in our day and age the church has been divided over things that it shouldn't be divided over. Verse 2, so the twelve gathered the multitude of disciples. Luke uses the word again, disciple here. Okay, He gathers the whole church. Multitude, too large to count at this time. This is the church. This isn't a group of disciples in the church over here. It is the church. The church is a group of disciples. He gathered them together and said, it would not be right for us to neglect the ministry that is the word used in the original Greek here. The ministry of the word of God in order to wait on tables to serve the food distribution. Brothers and sisters, instead, verse 3, choose seven men from among you, from among the church, who are known to be full of spirit and wisdom. We will turn that responsibility over to them. Now, you know me again, you may have a problem with it, you may not have a problem with it, but I don't have a problem reading different translations that are approved. The NIV translate this poorly because it tells you two things here. It says to be full of the spirit and wisdom. If you get to doing some research, you'll find out there's three things in the original text. It says an honest report, full of the Holy Spirit and full of wisdom. Oh, I need to have an honest report among men. And that honest report would not be just in the church, but it would be out there in the world. Like we got to with Merle Red. You live such good lives that even the pagans realize. And even though they might persecute you or whatever, they realize that you're doing what is right, what is godly. And you have hope they persecute you. And they wonder why you're not doing the things that you used to do. And then they have to ask you. Because you're different. You're a new creation in Christ. And then your testimony will mean something because you live a life that is holy. Does that mean that you'll be perfect? Well, it should be our goal, but I, I can tell you I fall short of that many times, and I'm sure you do too. <clears throat> 
And we're going to look at this. I put this in King James here and pointed out some of the words. Verse 4, and or buts what the King James says, we'll give our attention, which means continual devotion, to prayer and to the ministry of the word. The same, Luke is intentive again in his writing, and he gives the same word, ministry. There's a ministry of the word, and there's a ministry of the programs that the church does because of the needs. We'll give the, the ministry of the words. The word used here is dikonia. It's a noun. It means ministry or serving. The word that for ministry before was dikonio. It means a minister or a servant. Oh, yes, there's another word still that is where we get our word deacon from. So there's a third variation of that word also. But we see that it's a minister, ministry or serving. It requires a minister or a servant. And there's even an occupation that is set forth here that we can call a deacon or an elder in the church. The other word is diakonia. These are all servants of Jesus Christ, disciples who have taken on the teachings of their master to be like their master to train other people to be like Jesus so that they will train up others to be like Jesus. This is a huge structural design for the church, but like I said, we'll get into that to another day as far as, as deacons and so forth. I just want you to see here that this is the church. This is the pattern of the church. And we see a separation here of letting the 12 be called to presenting the, the word regularly and teaching so that the rest of the church could be serving in the ministry that they were called to serve in. And we can't be divided in that because as the ministries come up, we need to be willing to serve wherever it is and realize that the Holy Spirit gives gifts for us to serve over here. And this group over here is not any better, any worse, anything. We all have different functions. This is an arm. This is a leg. This is a heart. And all of them work together so that the body works properly with Jesus Christ being the head. This is Jesus' church. Verse 5, the proposal... The word here is logos. It's just like the word of God. The word here pleased the whole group, the entire multitude again. The entire number that was too large to count. The entire number of true disciples of Jesus Christ. Maybe they didn't understand the counted worthy of being suffering yet, but they understood what they were called to be doing as disciples. So they chose... Uh, seven men. Stephen, a man full of faith in the Holy Spirit. And notice, that's the only one that we really put a focus on here because that's who's going to be the focus on next. Then you have also Philip because we're going to see some focus on him in Scripture. And then we don't have the others in Scripture. The irony of this, if you don't catch this, is the Greek speaking came to the Hebrews and said, our widows, our poor old ladies... Our, our, oh, well, Jesus talked about how poor they were. Remember the widow that came and gave the least possible gift that the church would allow, but it's all that she had to live on. That's why this is, this is so poor. And whether or not they were being mistreated or not, doesn't matter. The Greeks came to the Hebrews and said, This is happening. And look at the men they appoint. Do you recognize those names? They're all Greek names. <laughs> the irony in that. When Satan tries to divide and conquer, God builds us all up together. And he says, well, let's divide out so that we can conquer better. Look at the irony in that. I would have said from my human standpoint, I don't want to appoint all Greeks. We're going to go right back to the same problem again. We need to have a mixture. Oh, there's seven. Well, we need to have four Hebrews since they were the ones that, that were on the bad end of the deal and three, but that's not the case. That's why we pick men and women that stand out, that realize that they have integrity, they have the fullness of the Spirit, and they have the fullness of wisdom so that they can get in and handle these programs and lead others. Verse 8, or verse 6, excuse me. They presented these men to the apostles who prayed and laid hands on them. They had an ordination ceremony of what was inside making it known outside. 
They re addressed the division that Satan was putting in the church and Satan fled from them. Did it stop the persecution and suffering? No. In fact, it brought the suffering right home to one of the seven. Verse 7, though, here's the results. Don't miss this. So the word of God spread. Isn't that the point? Isn't suffering worth that? Isn't shame worth that? And if it's counted as glory, the glory that Christ received, wow. And like I've said before, I, I use this one all the time, Jesus says don't build up treasures on earth, but instead build up treasures in heaven. And as men and women trying to rationalize that again, instead of coming with a childlike attitude, we say, well, I'm not focusing on this so that it's okay. And I am focusing on this, but Jesus said, don't, don't do this. Instead, do this. Don't worry about things that are your own. Sell them. Don't worry about this d division in the church. Address it. Live such godly lives that even though the pagans do whatever to you, they see your life is different. They see it's like Christ. And they ask you about the hope that you have. Because that's what it's about. So the word of God spread. The word here means grew and flourished. What happens when you plant a seed? It's supposed to grow and flourish. A mustard seed grows up into the tallest of the garden varieties so that even the birds can come and rest in its branches. You ask a child again when, when God goes out to sow his word and we get divided on the four different types of, of soil and what happens with each, the child again says, you plant a seed, it's supposed to grow in the plant it's supposed to be. It's supposed to produce a crop. It's supposed to give shelter for even the birds in the field. So the word of God spread, it flourished. And the number of, and he says this word again, the number of disciples in Jerusalem increased rapidly. Not just increased, now we've got an explosion. The Sadducees said, don't preach in the name of Jesus. An angel released them and said, go preach in the name of Jesus. Go right back to where you were arrested before. And they immediately get arrested so that they can, can proclaim the word of God to them again. Their leader says, don't touch them. But they beat them instead. And they leave counted worthy. So Satan says, now's the time to distract the church from, from within. The time is right. The twelve are suffering so we can scare the rest of these guys off no problem. That isn't what happened, is it? Because God is so much bigger. Instead, the word of God grew, spread, flourished. The number of disciples, those sold out for Jesus, training up other disciples in Jerusalem increased rapidly. What logically next needs to happen next? The gospel needs to spread outside Jerusalem, doesn't it? And it will, and it comes through persecution. But there's a bonus right here at the end. And a large number of priests became obedient to the faith. Who would have ever thought that would have happened in this section of Scripture? They, they look at the testimony of these men again and say, there's something different. There's something con to consider here. We've got to back up and consider, is it right to listen to men or is it right to be not only listening, but obedient? That word is used here. The same word that, the, that John and Peter said, who should we be obedient to? The same thing that they've been teaching all the ways of this life, the words of this life. They became obedient to the faith, every part of it. Not obedient to the law, obedient to living a life in Christ. Where there is no condemnation, there is no fear, there's only joy, thanksgiving, hope of what we have and this world is the place that we present that testimony and we live for God to bring Him glory and honor. Not my will be done, but your will be done. Not my kingdom come, but your kingdom come. Oh, let me forgive trespasses. Let me be uh, satisfied with my daily bread. So, Sherry, will you help me? 
we're going to make sure these are sanitized. Hand these out. Everybody gets one. You've got to get your shoes on. And I'm going to go over this one more time, and you'll have it. You can put it on your refrigerator. You can do a little maze and have fun. Kira loved it. And I want to remind you again, I need one, of how I set this up. I did a lot of copying and pasting and paint. For God so loved what? The world, every last one of us, even as enemies. He so loved the world that he did what? Something that's unfathomable, that makes no sense to this world. He gave his one and only son to die for you so that you could have eternal life instead of death. And not just eternal life, but abundant life here and now. Not so that you can be leading the sheep wrongly, but so that you can lead the sheep into the pen. And so they can come and go and find pasture. You are disciples of Jesus Christ. You are the church. Your purpose is to come in and figure out all this maze of people I don't like, I do like, uh, this person offended me, that person offended me, I don't like the color of the carpet, I need to put blinds on those windows so they don't blind us. That reminded me again when the beautiful sun's coming through it. Because my mission is to come in here and have fellowship with one another, koinonia, because I have fellowship with Jesus Christ his spirit, God's Spirit lives inside of me, empowers me to speak His message, to live a life that I could not live otherwise. He gives me gifts, and I'm supposed to have fruits of the Spirit, which are love, joy, peace, self-control, so forth and so on, so that I can live a life where my light so shines before men that they see my good deeds and glorify my Father who is in heaven. And that means when I come out of these church walls that I carry the cross of Jesus that I deny myself, take up my cross, whatever it is, whatever I don't want to do, whatever it costs me to proclaim the gospel message, because it says right here in these verses that the word grew, increased, multiplied, not grew, multiplication, and disciples increased. And even a great company of the priests were obedient to the faith. So now since you all have this, let's look at the King James, and I pointed out the words. And in those days when the number of mathetes, okay, disciples, was multiplied, not just a number growing, but multiplication in a number so great that we can't count now. We've already had 3,000, 5,000, and then a number we couldn't count, and now that's multiplied. There arose murmurings. Oh, those things that take us back to the wandering in the wilderness when the, when the, the uh, promised land was just there out of reach. But no one from that generation saw it. There arose murmurings inside the church because their widows, their poor, were neglected in daily dykonia ministration. Same word that we're going to see for gospel ministration. Then the twelve called the multitude, that number that's too great to count again, of the mathetes unto them and said it, it is not reason that we should leave the logos, the word of God, and dykonia, serve tables. Ministry. This person's ministry is just as important as this person's ministry, is just as important as this person's ministry, is just as important as the pastor's ministry. We all make up the body of Christ. Verse 3, Wherefore, brethren, look ye out among you, not go outside, and find seven men of honest report. That's what the NIV didn't put in there. Full of the Holy Ghost and wisdom. Men and women that you look at and say, yeah, they live their life like they should. And the reason of that is they're full of the Holy Ghost, and one of the things that the Holy Ghost will give them is wisdom. Because if you agree to follow after Jesus, He will give you, equip you with everything you need. You're already equipped with it. And when you get out and start serving, instead of not that murmuring will be going away. That fulfillment in your heart will increase. All these doubts that you had will go away because you're being the hands and feet of Jesus Christ. 
whom you may appoint over this business, the word means necessity, is what it means here. They call it a business, of the poor. But we will give ourselves continually, oh, that makes me think of what the church has already devoted itself to continually. We'll talk about that next week. And to the ministry or diaconia of the logos, of the word. And logos, this logos, this word that they told them, Please the whole multitude. And they chose Stephen, a man full of faith in the Holy Ghost. There's your first example you're going to see, just like you saw the good example of Barnabas versus the bad example in the church, and I won't mention names. Verse 6, Whom they set before the apostles, and when they had prayed, they laid their hands on them, and the word, the logos of God, increased. It grew, and the number of disciples, or mathetes, multiplied in Jerusalem greatly and a great number of priests were obedient to the faith. I, I can't think of much greater story in the Bible than this happening in the church. And it happened because of suffering and persecution and shame and ridicule almost to the point of being a beast. But yet they counted it worthy. And look at the results that happened. What an awesome story of growth, maturity in the church, of God working through His people, the church, of the church functioning like it should function, and numbers getting too great to count where they're going to have to divide and multiply out, and in this case it's going to come through suffering. But they are obedient, and they will learn what it means to be counted worthy for suffering disgrace because of Jesus Christ. So you know what that also says to me because we read it in Scripture earlier. They'll see heavens opened up and see the glory of God. Now that's something that I can say that I want to be able to comprehend. I don't know that I want to be drug into the suffering. Whatever it happens, happens. I cannot fathom that. I can't relate to it. But I want to see the heavens opened up and see the glory of God. And I see it every time that I think about Jesus the Son of God giving up heaven and coming laying down His life for me. Father in heaven, we do thank You and praise You for You are a mighty, awesome God. Your ways are so perfect, so much higher than ours. Lord, fill us with Your Spirit to be the kind of disciples that You have called us to be. Lord, we do pray for our family and so many of the blessings that we mentioned today were for those future blessings of children and grandchildren. Lord, your word says that you, that you will be faithful. Lord, we're the unfaithful ones. Give us your spirit through and through that we will increase our faith. And all, you said again, all we need is mustard seed size faith. Help us to realize the power of the Holy Spirit that lives inside of us, the purpose of the church, that each and every one of us are a part of that. And Lord, we just thank you and praise you for the opportunity to be a witness for Jesus Christ. We thank you and praise you in his name. Amen.